Hey everybody, I want to welcome you all to the second episode of Strange Appalachia's podcast. Uh, something that we're really, really excited about. Um, when our numbers first went up last week, me and JD decided that if we could get 10 subscribers and 20 likes, that we would be happy and it would be something to continue. So we've more than doubled the number of subscribers and we broke 100 likes. So that's pretty awesome. So we want to give some shout outs to some people, some fans. Uh, in the first 24 hours, uh, we had several, several likes and subscribes. Uh, the two I want to call out real quick, Sam Ology and Leslie Cheatham. Uh, Sam was our second subscribe. He's a guy I go to church with, uh, unbelievably knowledgeable guy about any number of subjects, uh, makes knives in his spare time. And if you get a chance, uh, you can Google him on, on Facebook or search him on Facebook or or just go to my page and find him on there, and you can see Big Iron Knives, is, I think is the name of his Facebook page, uh, and check out some of the knives that boy makes. It's unbelievable. And then Leslie Cheatham is a, a girl I used to work with at Lowe's, actually. Uh, really smart. Actually, uh, i got to give her kudos because she listens to or used to listen to every crazy story I would tell and didn't look bored once. So she's an incredible actress, apparently. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I've, I've got a few people as well. Again, uh, these people we're calling out are people who liked uh, or subscribed within the 20, first 24 hours of, of our podcast going up last week. We had more people that subscribed, um, but for some reason there's something that YouTube does and it won't show us everybody's name. Um, so uh, if you subscribe in that first 24 hours, we still appreciate it, but it won't tell us who you are, so we can't really... Uh, give you a shout out um, but for uh, three that I, I want to shout out uh, Luke McNeese uh, a guy I work with at Scouts uh, really cool guy um, uh, so uh, he's uh, known him for a long time just recently moved back to the area so thank you Luke uh, Sherry Allen uh, 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 teacher uh, at the high school I work at so uh, thank you Sherry and Kelly Whited, I especially want to thank you. You were our first subscriber, so thanks uh, for, for giving us that subscribe. You guys are awesome. And while we're at it, not just subscribers, uh, but we also have a couple of other people that we, we want to give uh, a big thank you to. Uh, they're supporters of ours, and they help us out with some technical know-how and stuff like that, because without these two uh, guys we're about to talk about, our podcast wouldn't be happening right now. And the first one is Mike Wolf. He's an amateur filmmaker that I work with at Scout Camp. Uh, has a ton of experience in that realm. Uh, has really helped me out a lot editing these videos, getting it together, and and figuring out what what would look good. Uh, even even when we we were doing our uh, first attempt with with the on video thing. So Mike. Thank you. Uh, you're awesome. And Charlie, you want to hit the next one? Yeah. A uh, guy by the name of Bill Lancaster. He's a killer filmmaker. He's got several documentaries out there. Two of them are about Bigfoot. I know he's got some more stuff like that coming on the way. The first one is Cultured Bigfoot. The second one is Paranormal Bigfoot. Uh, both of those documentaries are very, very well done. Uh, and he Absolutely. actually gave us, a, yeah, he gave us a little cameo at the end of Cultured Bigfoot. Let us get on camera sometimes, but Bill's always there when we call him. Uh, always got good things to say about us, and uh, I can't thank him enough for, for all the work he's done. Um, I want to give two more shout outs real quick. First one, or the next one, is to my wife because she puts up with all this, uh, giving me time and, and indulging me in my, some of my crazy hobbies. And the other one is to the Met team there at Home Depot that I work with now. Every one of those guys that has a Facebook account and has a computer has liked and subscribed, uh, and they go as far as to even talk to me about it at work. Uh, and they, they do rib me a little bit, but they actually listen to the podcast, and it, it just blows me away that, that those guys are listening to me too. On that same note, same thing goes to the, the teachers of Castlewood High School. Thank you all. I know there's several of you have, have come up and and – uh, talk to me about this in the past week. So thank you all. You guys rock. All right, let's get into some news stories real quick. 
uh, now that we got the the brown nosing over with. Uh, Absolutely. The uh, we've got a news story here. It's actually about three weeks old, and if we were actually uh, up and running three weeks ago, we would have definitely covered this as soon as it came out. I found out about it pretty early the morning that it happened, but it happened up around Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, and supposedly a man shot at a Bigfoot up there. The The story is kind of crazy. Yeah, th- but, this story is, is all over the place. Depending on which news article you read, you're going to get a different story. That's right. Uh, apparently the guy, he warned two other campers that were up there, a boy and his girlfriend, and they were in the backwoods camp, and he warned them that a Bigfoot had just attacked his camp. And if you heard gunshots, to to watch out because Bigfoot was attacking. And not 20 minutes later, uh, the couple heard shots. When they did, they packed their stuff up and left. Once they got to their car, it's about a five-mile hike. And once they got to their car, they uh, they called the authorities. And from there, that that's where the story starts changing. So it's a pretty yeah. interesting story. You know, both of us have been out in the woods, uh, you know, have been all over the place. And at three o'clock in the morning, to be scared enough of anything to pack your stuff up and hike five miles out to a car, you got to be pretty scared. Now, who knows if they were scared of a Bigfoot or just scared of the guy running around with a gun? Yeah, I would guess it would be the guy with the gun. Yeah, that's that's what would have got me up and moving. That's for sure. Yeah, that... That Mammoth Cave area, I was lucky enough one time to actually actually to get to go up there and tour the cave, and it is remote. Uh, at the time when I went up there, the closest the closest town that you could actually go and, and you know have a dinner, a warm meal, so to speak, was about a thirty minute drive, and it was a Cracker Barrel. I actually drove through the area about five or six years ago, coming back from a work related thing, and. The Cracker Barrel's still there. The town's still there, and it doesn't look like it had grown up. So it, it it's a extremely remote area, and there are Bigfoot sightings in the area. So uh, it, it's I'll, one I'll of those. I'll have to take your word on that one because I've I've never been to the area myself. So yeah, it's remote. It's pretty remote. They don't have anything but the caves. So all right. Well, uh, anything else you want to share with the the strange news there? That's that's the biggest story right now going on. Like I said, we're we're up and running now, so whenever we get a new story in, uh, something weird like a Bigfoot sighting, something something that actually uh, makes the news, we'll be able to report on it pretty quickly. Um, my take on this is that it it seems to me like it was just some guy with a gun. I don't think Bigfoot was actually involved in it. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's some some crazy guy myself, because cause the more I, I read about it, the more the stories don't match, the more um, this guy just, just looks like a uh, a guy with a gun in, a, in the woods that's, you know, not all there in some he, capacity or another. Yeah, it could be something as simple as him trying to be Bigfoot famous, so to speak, you know, yeah. trying to make something for himself. That that's, happens a lot unfortunately absolutely it, it's something that that makes actual bigfoot researchers you know people out there that are actually trying to to look for something and prove or disprove it makes them look bad yeah yeah no doubt so well move, moving on past that to hit a, a quick recap of last week's video um we talked a lot about the dog man um, but i think one of the highlights of the video that we posted on wednesday of our uh attempt of the on-site dog man uh, that we sort of missed out on was the uh, Snallygaster, Snellygaster. Um, you know, I think that was us talking about that was one of the highlights of that, and we missed it in the preview. Um, so so we just want to go back and, and hit on the Snallygaster real quick and uh, talk about some of the stuff we've got planned with it in the future, because we, we definitely want to get up uh, towards middle Virginia and investigate that thing because it's awesome. Yeah, the Snelly Gaster is a, described as a giant bird with an octopus for a face or an octopus in place of a beak. Sometimes it's got tentacles that hang underneath it. And its its mortal enemy was the dog man. And once again, the dog man being primarily a, a northern uh, cryptid or a northern uh, legend 
for it to be in middle of Virginia is very, very strange. Not to say that the Snellygaster itself isn't strange, because that's a pretty weird cryptid to be seen flying around. But they're, yeah, they're as as, as terrifying as the Dogman sounds. That that Snellygaster is is way, way, way more terrifying in my opinion. Yeah, we've got we've got some contacts up there in in middle of Virginia that have land that we can go out and investigate and look for things. And when I say land, I mean enormous, enormous tracts of land. Yes. So uh, if it's if it's around, it would be a, a good spot to look for it. So we're going to go up there and give that a an investigation soon. Hopefully, maybe this fall. Probably not in the winter time, but it, it's something that we're looking forward to doing. Yep. So so definitely stay tuned to that. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do a whole podcast devoted to it before we get up there and bring everybody up to speed on what that thing is. Certainly, and 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 there's a couple of more things we'll we'll probably hit while we're up there, and and so uh, just be looking for those. I, I think it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, trip for sure. Yeah, no doubt. So let's talk a little bit about some vampires in Southwest Virginia. Let's uh, do it. Yeah, the the mountains of Virginia are not known for their vampires. Typically, when you think of vampire stories in America. You're going to think somewhere like Savannah, Georgia, or down into New Orleans. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe out in California, some of those bigger cities, or, or New York, somewhere that has more of a, a population base. But our hometown of Big Stone Gap actually has a, an extremely interesting vampire story, and the name of the vampire was Old Rupp. Yeah, Old Rupp, uh, this, this story dates back to the late 1800s, about 1890s. The area was undergoing a, a coal boom. The economy was booming. They had a lot of people coming in that hadn't been here before. And one of them was a guy named Rupp. And uh, he, he stood out as far as immigrants go. He, uh, he didn't fit in with, with the other immigrants that were, were moving into town looking for work. He had long, straight black hair, piercing blue eyes. Um, his his dress was sort of out of style for the time. He wore tall hats. He wore a cape. Um, his his English was very broken. He didn't speak very well. He had a very heavy um, Slavic accent, and uh, he he just didn't fit in. Yeah, the the immigrants in the area at the time um, we had a, a of course the classic European settlers that you think of uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, Irish and Scottish. Um, Native Americans, and then uh, you had crossbreeds of Native Americans and Irish and Scott. Uh, the occasional runaway slave would come to the area because uh, while Virginia wasn't a free state, typically in the in the mountains, no one cared what you did as long as you stayed on your own property. Right. You know, they they were uh, would get a bad rap in the area for for being racist, but people in the mountains of of Appalachia, they're pretty accepting of of people around them. You know, as long as you stay away from them, you know, just just everybody's left to their own devices. Uh, yeah, the other, very the much. other, yeah, the other base in in Big Stone Gap was actually Italian. A lot of Italian people settled the area because of the the mining. And there's actually an area in Big Stone Gap still called Italy Bottom, uh, or Italy Bottom. And up until the 80s, we had some pretty good Italian food there, but when the coal started going away, of course, we lost a lot of that heritage. Right. Yeah, Old Rupp doesn't fit any of those uh, no. narratives. And and so he moved into town into a place um, that, oddly enough, was called Bloody Branch. And the, the story goes it was called Bloody Branch because the water would oftentimes uh, run red because near the source of the, the branch, there was a high iron content. And, of course, if you put iron in water, it rusts. Rust looks red, so uh, the the waters looked red like it had blood in it, so it was called Bloody Branch. Interestingly enough, uh, no map that we can find has a place called Bloody Branch on it. There's a, a Butcher's Fork, um, names like that, and none of the, the branches in the area that we believe uh, this story to be talking about have that high iron content, although there are plenty of streams in the area that do, just not that specific area. Yeah, so we're either off on air 
where we think it happened at, or the other option is that it, you know, it's just another tall tale. The the book Dracula had just came out around the same time as yes as this story. It was about ten years after this story supposedly took place is when Dracula came out. So that influence may be there as well. And and on that same note, we can also not find any record at all of an actual immigrant named Rupp, just this story. So uh, I, I think while this is an interesting story, we're still going to tell it. I believe Charlie and I are both in agreement that uh, it's at least, if nothing else, a stretch of the truth. Yeah, there there may have been, you know, even a population of immigrants like that 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 didn't hang around very long, and they may have taken a bad rap, kind of like uh, gypsies get a bad rap. You know, all gypsies are blamed for what one gypsy would do. Something similar to that may have happened here. Right. So it, the the story sort of starts um, with several farmers in the the area of Bloody Branch. Uh, reporting that their livestock had gone missing, and they'd find it a day or two later, um, and there would be nothing left of the livestock except maybe some limbs, and uh, the the few bodies that they did find were completely drained of blood, um, which obviously is very strange, and it stuck out to people, because, um, you know, if a wild animal gets in and, and gets your livestock, it's just going to rip it to shreds. There'd be blood everywhere. It wouldn't be neat. It wouldn't, you know, there would be evidence of that. And, yeah. and um, so after these livestock start going missing, uh, you know, the the alert goes up, and then um, they find the town drunk. Uh, the story says his name is Bad Dan Wampler, and they find uh, Bad Dan in much the same state as those livestock. Uh, completely drained of blood and missing limbs. And on that same note, I will say there is a large population of people in this town named Wampler. Uh, we even have an area called Wampler Hollow. So, uh, you know, that name historically very well could have been uh, an actual person, although, again, no specific record we found of that time period of a guy named Dan Wampler. Yeah, it's interesting that we do have the name there. And the, the funny thing about it is that's the only name in the story that's given other than, than Rupp. Right. No, uh, but anyway, so after, after they find Bad Dan, uh, there are two boys from the town that, that are out in the woods one day, and they decide they're going to sneak up and uh, see what, what old Rupp's doing because, you know, He's weird, he's a mystery, and, and, you know, these boys just wanted to figure out what was going on, so they sneak up on the cabin, they look inside, and they see old Rupp sitting down to eat a meal of uh, raw meat and drinking blood out of a, uh, out of a, a cup. Uh, and, of course, that spooks them. They run back into town, they tell their parents, and the parents call the sheriff. And the sheriff basically says, you know, that's weird and everything, but nothing he's doing is illegal, so I can't do anything. Yeah, it doesn't take long after this that a traveling salesman goes missing. And he's only described as a popular traveling salesman who travels from North Carolina through Virginia into Kentucky. Right. And so not only does he go missing, but eventually they find him. Um, and his body is stashed less than 100 yards from uh, Old Rupp's cabin. And when that information gets out, um, basically the town forms a lynch mob. They're, they're, they're determined that Old Rupp's the guy that did this. So they go to his cabin, and uh, they don't find him there. So they go ahead and, and break in and find... Um, all sorts of meat in his cupboards, both human and livestock. And they decide that that's all they need to see, and they burn the cabin down, and they go look for it. And, of course, like any good vampire story, they never find him. But, yeah, the, the description actually says that they find organs strewn from the ceiling. Right. So that's the quote from the story, organs strewn from the ceiling. So apparently it was a pretty bloody mess. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and you know, 
realistically speaking, it very well could have been a, a person that was, was living there that was a cannibal. Um, and, and it's just got sort of stretched into a vampire story. But the fact that they never found him um, in the story is, is what leads to it being a vampire story and not just a cannibal story. Um, yeah, and, and to no help perpetuate that, that. Go I'm ahead. Uh, I was going to say, to help perpetuate that, you sort of have a, a more recent story than the 1800s, right? Yeah, so when I was probably 14 years old, and this is before I'd ever even heard the story of Old Rupp, I guess I was 13 or 14, me and a buddy of mine actually were heading up through an area called Maples Gap. And uh, we were pretty far up in there, and Maples Gap wasn't an area that we, we frequented, but we were up there because it was steep. And we were going to ride our bicycles down because, you know, a 13-year-old kid wants to go fast on a bicycle. Right. We got pretty we got pretty far up in the holler, and we noticed a group of farmers off in a field. And we wanted to know what they were staring at. So me and my buddy, we walked down there to them. And lo and behold, there's a cow or half a cow, the front half of a cow. The back half is totally gone. The, the skin is still there, but it's been laid back across the top of the cow. And you can look up into the cow, up into where its organs would be, and it looked like something had just corded out, uh, totally hollow, except for the meat, and there was no blood anywhere. And so here we are standing with these, with these farmers, and I look over at one of them finally, and, you know, what did this? And the old guy says, Rupp, had to be Rupp, he does this sometimes. And so, you know, me not having a clue what's going on, didn't even think to ask what Rupp was. Right. Um, so we all stood there for a little bit when one of the farmers said, what are you boys doing up here? Y'all need to get out of here. Get off my property. So me and my buddy took off. Uh, of course, a few years later, you know, going through old books and you find the story of old Rupp, you, you figure out, you know, two and two together, uh, that Rupp is still in the culture. It's not something that you hear about very often. And in fact, that's the only time I've ever heard anybody mention it. But it right. is, that is ingrained in the culture. Uh it could be something that they use to explain cattle mutilations. I know that out west they have an issue with cattle mutilations. Um, and so I imagine if it happens out west, it would probably happen here too. Just not, since there's not as many cows, it's not going to be as common. So it right. could be a way that they're, they're explaining cattle mutilations as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a weird story, but uh, I, I think it is that, just a story. Um, if anything, then, uh, you know, it's a, a cannibal that um, probably escaped and live, lived out his life in the mountains as long as he could. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, even if he, if he was a vampire, it's a serial killer story for sure. Um, Absolutely. A lot of, a lot of the, the, well, the two bodies they talk about had the same M.O. So, I mean, really, in the end, who knows? I, I highly doubt that there's a vampire running around the the mountains of southwest Virginia. Certainly. I, I definitely do not believe that. All right. I, I guess uh, in, anything else you want to add on the old Rupp? Uh, not really. There's not really much you can add to that. That's a, It's just a freaky, crazy story. Uh, you can research it. It's out there. You can read it yourself. It's a pretty good story. Yeah. Uh, I encourage everybody to go through and read it. Just Google old Rupp vampire, and it'll be the first thing that pops up. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess that does it for the week. Yeah. Should be good. All right, then. Uh, everybody, uh, same as always, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we, we appreciate the support you guys give us. Uh, as always, if you like what you heard, leave us a like and subscribe. And uh, I guess uh, we'll we'll see you all next week. Yeah, if anybody out there has anything at all they want to report, uh, give us a text or a call. Uh, shoot us a message there on Facebook. We'll be happy to come out and look at what you got. Absolutely. Until next week, stay strange. I appreciate it, guys.